The Charter Podcast, Episode 13. Code Red for Humanity, Part 5. Marine and Tidal Power, with Dr. Carwin Frost and Dr. Louise Krechting of the Centre for Advanced Sustainable Energy, CASE, and Sue Barr of the UK Marine Energy Council. Hosted by me, Morris McCartney. For this, the last episode in the Code Red for Humanity series, I've come here to the mouth of Strangford Loch. Why? Well, the clue's in the name. Strangford, strong ford, the Norse called it, when they discovered the sheer power of the tidal currents that surged through these narrows day after day. And it's that power that researchers from Queen's University to Belfast are here to investigate. My name's Dr. Karen Frost. I'm a lecturer here at Queen's University in the Department of Civil Engineering in the School of Natural and Built Environment. And my area of research is into marine renewable energies. Uh, specifically, um, I'm the principal investigator on the vertical axis tidal turbines in Strangford project. Uh, and that's the VATS project funded by the Centre for Advanced Sustainable Energy, CASE, and the um, Invest Northern Ireland. So I'm Dr. Louise Crickdean. Um, I'm also working on the VETS project with Cal. I'm the uh, co-I on the project. Um, I'm a senior lecturer here in the School of Natural and Built Environment, also in the Civil Engineering Department. Um, but my uh, area of expertise is more on the environmental interactions of wave and tidal devices on the environment itself. My name is Sue Barr. Um, I am chair of the UK Marine Energy Council. Um, I've been involved in the wave and tidal sector for some 22 years, um, wearing a number of hats actually, and have had a a long career working with the sector and and trying to advance the sector moving forward. Um, I also sit on a number of boards, um, marine power systems and verdant power in the US, a tidal technology developer, and have been working with CASE through the industry advisory board Um, to really help take forward marine energy um, into our future energy systems. So the marine energy obviously is going to be an important part of a package as we move towards a clean energy. But exactly how significant do you think it might become? What sort of what's the state of play at the minute? And, And how much energy do you think we could get? So it's a really interesting question, um, and it really speaks to what do we want marine energy to be or to do in our energy system. So we often looked at uh, wave and tidal energy as being able to be comparable to fixed offshore wind in that, that growth profile of bringing technology through from early stage prototypes through to multiple devices in the water and arrays that have capacity for hundreds of megawatts of production. The technology at the moment is at the small array scale. There are multiple devices, both in the wave and tidal sector that are being brought forward to to pre-commercial and to to commercial readiness. And interestingly, we look at the global market as being very significant. So the thought process around marine energy in terms of what it offers to us as as a form of electricity production has started to shift somewhat. And we're now starting to think about it as perhaps base load combined with storage, but also large scale arrays. The global market is really, really interesting. There are several different types of um, deployments that we might want to move forward with. So larger arrays and smaller systems that take um, remote communities off diesel generation and into more renewable sources of energy. So it has a number of USPs in terms of being a technology type that we can develop, we can look to commercialize. The IEA produced a report where it was looking at the global market for marine energy being about 76 billion. And of course, a lot of technology developers are looking at that and saying we see an opportunity here and developing technology types. So there are still multiple technologies, um, both in the wave sector where we see point source extractors and we see um, uh, fixed bed um, extractors, so flaps and and, and paddles that are looking at extracting energy in, in those wave environments. And we're often seeing oscillating water column as well. In the tidal sector, really we're converging into two areas, floating turbines and those fully submerged. There's also kite technology in the form of Monesto's technology, looking at uh, generating from, from tidal flows. 
So still an interesting diversification of technologies. And I think that's important to remember as we move forward, because we suspect that the receiving environments will be very different. It isn't one size fits all. So we may need multiple technologies for multiple sites. Caroline, maybe I'll, I'll turn to you first then and ask about the, is it it's turbines that you're, you're putting in, vertical turbines? Yeah, that's correct. So a traditional turbine that people would think of is like a wind turbine, which rotates about a horizontal axis. Um, what we're doing with this BATS program um, is looking at vertical axis tidal turbines or turbines. So uh, these would rotate around the vertical axis. And so um, that means there's different flow dynamics going on. Um, and this is of great interest to us, then there may be some competitive advantage in such an application in the tidal environment. And so there are a number of companies that are looking at this technology, but the company we've partnered with for this project, our industrial partner, is G-Kinetic. Um, and their technology then is a 10 kilowatt uh, device. So it's quite a small, it's for local community scale device. This is a prototype that we'll be testing in Strangford Block to see how it matches up against the performance predictions we expect. This isn't the first uh, set of turbines that you've tried out in, in Strangford Lock. First of all, tell us why Strangford Lock uh, in particular. Yeah, that's a, a really good point. So Strangford Lock is ideally located for tidal testing because it's a very high flow environment uh, between Strangford Lock itself and the Irish Sea. So there is a narrow in between these two large bodies of water. Um, so as the tides rise and fall, water rushes in and out of these narrows that uh, allow us to have these really high velocities, which is really important for tidal energy extraction. So um, the power that we can extract from a device is related to the velocity of the water passing that device to the power of three or cubed. And so the higher the velocities we can get, the more potential energy there is in, in the flow. And you tried... Uh the other kind of turbine before, the, the well, I suppose horizontal axis turbine, if that's correct. Um, yes, so we, we've been researching the horizontal axis turbine for a long time, and we've had great success with it. Um, it has competitive advantage in the fact that uh, during its um, rotational uh, cycle, at no point do the hydrofoils go into the stall regime, whereas with a vertical axis, it's known that hydro, the hydrofoils will at some point go into the stall regime, which means that in theory that the, the vertical axis will be less efficient. But it's the, the vertical axis's advantage comes from the fact that it provides a projected area that is a rectangular shape. And that projected area allows us to cover a better area of the channel if we were to put these in kind of an array, a fence, or a series of, of turbines. So it, it works quite nicely with quite a rectangular channel kind of area. And so we can get a lot more interaction between these devices um, if they're in the vertical axis, uh, which, which is uh, preferential then. Um, the G-Kinetic device, to be specific, has a bluff body upstream of the two turbines. And this bluff body accelerates the flow around it and this accelerated flow then enters the turbines so it's sort of an inverted duct um, so a ducted turbine would, would accelerate the flow going into the rotor plane this does the same thing with this bluff body and so we can get these higher flow rates which again going back to my earlier point is very important for the power production because it's velocity cubed There are a number of targets that have been set across Europe, and we're hoping that we would have one gigawatt in the water by 2030. And that would be a combination of both wave and tidal technology. The capability to be part of the energy mix, again, is, is a balance between the capacity, how, how will we scale these arrays, and also the value add. So if you think about tidal in particular, it is predictable. So what we're looking for is an energy source that can balance out those periods when the wind may not blow or we can't have access to gas. So this predictability of tidal, it again, is, is a very unique point. There are markets globally. So island nations such as Indonesia, we know that there's resource in Korea. There's some areas in the Tasman Sea. And um, particularly in the UK, we're looking at around 18 gigawatt potential um, of tidal stream and wave power. 
Um, so there is the significant resources in significant areas. The importance will be mapping those to the energy systems and the off takers and finding that market mechanism that best fits the delivery of, 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 that, of that system. And it's really about shared gains. So it's about taking risks now to invest in technology and bring it forward, as we saw in the offshore wind sector, um, when you know wind was marinized, taken from a, a terrestrial environment and, and put into the marine environment on monopiles. Similarly, for, for wave and tidal development, we'll need to look at ways of installation, of reducing cost in the LCOE, the levelized cost of energy, but ultimately the market is significant, but it has a kind of niche role to play in some ways in that it will fill areas that other forms of energy, energy generation may not. And particularly in terms of its value to the overall electricity system, the mechanics and both the balancing and also the cost metric in the electricity system, we've still got some work to do there, but we know that idea of predictability may help balancing, may help baseload, um, and will certainly help in some areas where there simply isn't the land space or the sea space to put offshore wind um, or onshore wind. So it has a unique proposition and the, and the size of the market really is determined by those sites and how the technology develops at this stage. So the, the location is obviously very important. The design you're just talking about is, is interesting and, and I suppose quite novel. Um, the location is very important for the strength of the flow, but of course, Strangford Loch, uh, I happen to live beside Strangford Loch. Um, and as I know, it's an area of outstanding natural beauty and it's a very rich, it's rich in biodiversity. So I suppose some people probably will be thinking you're going to be putting turbines in this sort of rather sensitive environment. Um, and Louise, I know that's the sort of thing you've been studying. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your work on that? Yeah, so we've been... Um looking at this part, um, looking at the environmental interaction of the devices uh, for a number of years now. So we've worked with, um, there used to be marine current turbines, so Queen's was actually involved in all the environmental monitoring program for that, um, which looked at um, basically the passage of seals past the, uh, and um, harbour porpoises as well, as well as um, the bird life around it. So. Um, they also investigated things like what actually happens in the seabed. As you can appreciate when you're, you know, as a visitor, you can only see what's happening at the surface, but there's actually a lot underneath the water, obviously, in, in the narrows. We've actually got an amazing, pristine environment there. But uh, from all that we could see from sea gen, there was definitely no, um, uh, you know, adverse effects. There was um, never anything uh, that we could record that was... was um, as a, at a disadvantage or, you know, there was no issues with it. Um, we've also been working with uh, other companies as well. So there's, um, you're probably aware, the Manesto company is also in, in, in the Narrows um, and they have a kite device. And we've done quite a bit of work with them, um, with Queens and uh, the, the company in Sweden. Um, we've looked at things like noise because noise is actually also one of the key issues as well as collision risk. And we've, Queen's has actually developed a, a collision risk model. It's actually using um, gaming software. But basically, this model will be now applying to this um, BATS project to actually um, for their uh, the G Kinetics device. Um, we've looked at sound as well, and uh, even and from a number of different turbines, because over the years with uh, Carwin, obviously, we've had a few different um, developers coming in, so we can get sort of an idea about the, you know, the different noises. But you know, from just prototype single devices, there, uh, there, yes, there is a bit of a noise coming from the device itself, but it's no different from, say, the ferry that goes back and forth between Port of Ferry and Strangford every day. Um, and with the G Kinetic device, uh, the thing, the, the nice thing with this is actually the flow rate of the blades themselves is actually at the same flow rate as the tidal, um, the background tide, the flow rate. So if we're talking about a one metre a second flow rate, then the blades are only moving at one metre a second. So it's almost like a blockage, if you like, for any, say, for seals coming past. They, they would expect it to be like a pile for them, you know. And so if they can deal with, like, the moving ferry, they'll certainly be able to, you know, easily move around this device itself. I guess this, the, the device being stable is a bit more predictable than the ferry in, in some ways. Yeah, very much so, so. I suppose also in terms of the noise, you know, 
if you've got a constant noise, as anybody who lives in town knows, if, you, if you've got the constant noise of traffic, you just block it out after a while. Um, I presume the seals are, are smart enough to do something similar. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing with noise is we were looking at more it was sort of like the listening space. So, yes, right up at the very it, – it's sort of I always like to describe it a bit like a – you know, you go to a nightclub – and you're right by the speakers, you can't have a conversation with anybody because the noise is just so loud. But if you move away towards the bar or even outside the nightclub, you can hear the, the sound of the music, but you can have a normal chat with your, your you know, your colleagues, your friends. Um, and so it's it's a bit like that. So the further away you get from the device, and we're talking, we're talking, uh, I think around 50 to 100, me- you know, 50 metres, I think, from not this particular device, we haven't measured this, obviously, but other devices, um, you know, within even 50 metres, the, the noise level has dropped dramatically. And the background noise is actually just as noisy, if, if not just on different frequencies. So. so it's absolutely critical that we go through that R&D stage. And when we say R&D, it's not simply about building a nacelle and, and blades and putting it in the water um, and testing it. There's everything from the ability to measure the resource and calculate your capacity factors and your power curves through to the environmental impact assessments, through to material science, through to the operations and maintenance of turbines. And in all of those areas, we require really solid research. And actually, that has been where I think um, the UK in particular and um, centres of excellence like CASE Uh, the Offshore Renewable Energy Supergen program, for example, have really driven forward the agenda and removed some of those barriers. In a technology development space, you have limited opportunity to explore those areas in full. So we've seen some really, really good collaborations between industry and academia in order to solve solve some of the, the primary problems that are going to face this sector. So it's absolutely critical we keep innovating. It's absolutely critical. There are strong links between industry and the research community in order to identify those areas that are absolutely critical to bringing this to fruition and really sharing that knowledge and experience. So I I think the opportunities there are really important. And I also think we should be valuing them. So knowledge capacity, the ability to bring people through from early stage researchers through to you know, making valuable contributions to companies that are facing some of these challenges is hugely, hugely important. So it's a combination of industry, people and R&D to make sure we can deliver on this. And I think ultimately that investment into research will be recirculated in the economic opportunities and the gross value added we see to our economies at the moment. So it is critically important um, on all fronts. So, Carl, Carl, when you were saying uh, that it's, um, did you say 10? Uh, 10 kilowatt device. Kilo, kilowatts. Uh, but the nice thing about this is obviously it's running for um, roughly 12 hours a day. So if we take each tidal cycle, it's, it's operating for three hours for the flood cycle, three hours for the ebb, and that's happening twice a day then. So it could be operating up to 12 hours in a day. And that, so that, was that for each individual turbine or is that like the whole? The whole so that would be each individual uh, platform. So each platform has two turbines um, on it. So, so if you, you know, five kilowatts each, um, it would be each turbine. Uh, but then we'll be testing two platforms in, in, in the lock. So we'll have a total of 20 kilowatts in, in the water. We should be... Uh, like a prototype then just to, to test the well actually this is um it's not a, a, a it's a full-scale prototype so that this is going to be one of their product range they have a larger capacity so g kinetic have a device that goes up to 70 kilowatts mm-hmm. uh, but this 10 kilowatt is very much for uh community scale energy production so it you know this device can provide sufficient energy or an array of these devices is sufficient energy to power a number of homes, you know, we're talking in the, the you know, tens to twenties of, of, of homes over a period of a year. Um, so, you know, this is going to make an impact to those small communities or uh, local industries such as uh, offshore aquaculture, 
um, and other energy users in the marine environment would would these types of pro or these types of devices would be very appropriate for so off grid type or community scale type projects is what they're targeting with this technology. I wonder then if um, if the idea is that you put in a, a quite a few of these arrays, Louise, uh, maybe that would change the picture in terms of the impact on. That, that's that's the key question, um, and we yeah, there's whilst there's been a lot of um, discussion about what an array would look like, how an array or animals would interact with an array. Unfortunately, because there there aren't, um, I think Pentland Firth has got four um, from the Atlantis um, devices, and that's that's probably the biggest array in the world at the moment. Um, but whilst we're learning a lot from that information, but it's all commercially sent, you know, it, it's all um, run by a commercial company. So we don't, they're not sort of scientifically publishing a lot of information yet. But yeah, the, the, the key question now is if you were to like have a number of devices, what is the environmental interaction? But um, from the picture we're getting from single devices, there's certainly no, no issue with just a single device. The animals are well aware of the, of the, of the device in the water. Um, the noise is actually a good thing so they can hear it. Um, and then obviously, I mean, they, they locate predator or prey underwater, you know. So if they can um, um, locate prey, they should be able to like know that there's, there's a device in the water. I guess so. It's a bit like the um, electric cars, you know, sometimes I, I think they're talking about building in sound, having to build in sound just because if you go to step off a road and you, you haven't heard the car coming. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess the noise is a warning signal. So. <laughs> yeah. The, the main thing with the noise is as long as it's not interfering in the same frequencies as, as their, um, you know, how, what they use to locate prey or they interact for behavior wise, that that's the main, the key thing. So, um, and generally, you know, the background noise from the actual narrows itself is actually quite, quite loud because there's a lot of boulder movement underneath but we've also got a lot of you know commercial and um, leisure pleasure crafts that go past as well so you've got and like I said the ferry that goes back and forth um, which is not very far from where the actual device will be placed so uh, there's a lot of other background noise but it is local it's very localized so what's the sort of forecast for this uh, project how, how many years are we we're a couple of weeks away from our first deployment and the two devices then will be in the water for a total of about six months. Um, so this will give us a long period of time to test their performance and to test the, um, the environmental interactions with the, with the devices. Um, the project runs for a further 12 months after that, um, and at which point then we will be able to write up, obviously, our findings on this report and also build towards the next stage in the project, which is not only to have the uh, device on site and producing the energy, but also have that energy then connected to either a battery that is located on the device or next to the device as like a floating battery, um, which could be used to, to, to then power offshore aquaculture, for example, or to bring that power to shore through a cable um, and to power local communities on land. And that the, the techno-economic assessment of which of those two options works from a commercial point of view is what the latter stages of this project will investigate, is how can we commercialize this community, community scale type device uh, and which is the best avenue for commercialization? Is it a battery storage, like an energy harvesting type device, or is it a grid connected or, or cable to shore type? Device. And, and it may be very, or it, in all likelihood, it's going to come down to um, the user profiles. Um, so in this project, we're going to use the Queen's Marine Laboratory, which is located a stone's throw from the site where the devices are, as our user profile. So we'll be matching the technology with an end user, um, as an example, in this project. And I wonder, um, how do you envisage the future after that? Do you think this is likely to be taken up? Is, could it be used elsewhere off the Scottish coast or around the rest of the coast of Northern Ireland or Ireland? Yeah, so the aim of the project is to have a follow-on. Uh, so we're certainly looking to develop the next stage, which would be to test this device um, 
with an end user in mind. So, so whether that be battery or, or grid connected. Um, now we're partnered with G Kinetic and they are also involved in the City Ex Exchange project or City X, which is a Horizon 2020 project down in Limerick, um, where they are actually going to be looking at putting these devices into the water in um, uh, foins and seeing how these devices can add to the community energy down there. Uh, there's a trading platform associated with that project. So, so there's definitely going to be a legacy beyond this project in terms of use of these devices. Um, but from a Queen's perspective, we're very interested in being a support to the industry to bring their devices out of the lab and into full scale or prototype scale testing in the real field. And so we're really keen out of this project, not only to develop G-Kinetics technology and their commercialization, but also to develop our own site asset, which is the Strength and Narrows test site, and use it to promote tidal energy um, through uh, bringing other commercial developers onto site and, and supporting the, their development of their prototypes, uh, but also um, making this open to the masses in terms of uh, you know, community engagement and, and making people aware that tidal energy is certainly from a UK perspective, from an Irish perspective, and from kind of a West Coast Europe perspective, it's a very big um, contributor or could be a very big contributor in terms of renewable energy. I wonder, Louise, uh, in terms of the, if it does expand around different parts of the coastline and, and, and so forth, can you foresee any issues from your side of the, the studies or is it likely to be fine as well in those sorts of places? It's, it's, it's likely to be fine. I mean, the big um, hurdles for putting in these developments is also the shared resource. Um, we have to, you know, they have to consider the shipping lanes, the fisheries. Um, so whilst the resource is actually there around our coastlines, it's not simply you just choose a spot and put it there. There, there needs to be um, a lot of, you know, going through the consenting process and licences uh, with the different uh, devolved governments. Um, but no, I, I don't see a problem with them eventually going in. It's just a matter of time and when this actually occurs. But yeah, like I said, they, they need to be, um, you know, you can't just put them anywhere, everywhere because there's, there's so many different users of the sea. I imagine this is something that would fit in with a, an, a, an array. There's, an, there's that word again, you know, a range yeah. of different uh, measures that uh, which obviously... I suppose at the moment, most people, when they think of renewable energy, they think of solar panels on your roof and maybe a big uh, turbine, wind turbine somewhere. Um, how do you see this fitting in? How much of a, what sort of proportion of energy do you think one could get theoretically from the tide and so forth? Well, there are a lot of studies. Obviously, tidal is, is very... Um, constrained in terms of where it could be deployed because you need these high flow environments around your coastline and those only happen in certain places around the UK but studies of um, tidal energy have shown that between five and ten percent of uh, thinking of the UK specifically of their electricity demand could be met by tidal energy now that's quite a large proportion of your electricity demand that could be met by a technology that is not only um, out of sight in terms of being beneath the water surface and so very much um, away from, from the public's eye, but also um, it's very predictable. Uh, unlike solar and wind, um, tidal energy can be predicted down to the hour, minute and second, 100 years in advance if we want it. And that's very attractive from a grid um, operator's perspective, if they know when this energy is going to come online, it allows them to, to balance the load in terms of demand versus supply in a, in a lot tighter way. And that's something that not many renewable energy technologies can boast about. So, so we do think it has a great competitive advantage from that point of view. So good to hear you're already thinking about 100 years ahead there. That's, uh, <laughs> that's very encouraging. So... Um, and that all sounds very fascinating and, and we'll hopefully we'll be able to when we come back to you after it's all been done and dusted and, and we'll uh, see how, it's, how you've got on but in the meantime uh, Dr. Carwin Frost and Dr. Louise Craigling thank you very much 
Thank you very much too. Thanks for us. Many thanks to Dr. Carwin Frost, Dr. Louise Crichting, and Sue Barr. Follow us on social media at QUB Engagement, and for more in this series, visit our website, go.qub.ac.uk slash charter hyphen podcast, or subscribe to Queen's University Belfast, The Charter Podcast, on all the main podcast platforms. <laughs>